Welcome. Welcome to this session of Philanthrothink on wise investing, ESG, impact, and responsible investing. It's an issue of great importance to the sector uh, to, and a challenge for many foundations, for charities, and for individual philanthropists. I'm Susan Phillips, professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration and graduate supervisor of the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Carleton University is situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. As settlers, immigrants, as descendants, and as visitors, we honor and respect the many indigenous people of this land and hope for a more just future together. We have a great panel today, and let me briefly introduce them, and I won't uh, do justice to their ex expertise by any means. Tessa Hebb, Dr. Tessa Hebb is a longstanding adjunct uh, professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration and former director of Carleton's Center uh, for Community Innovation, 3CI. For many years, taught, uh, Tessa taught our course on impact and responsible investing in the MPNL and has published widely on responsible investing, including the Rutledge Handbook. Christina Inring is president and CEO of Sustainable Capacity Foundation, which builds capacity among small nonprofit organizations in the environmental sector. And she's a board member of Environmental Funders Canada and works with various foundations on their investment teams. And importantly, Christina is a graduate of the MPNL. Third, Richard Maitland, who joins us from the UK, and we do appreciate the time difference, Richard, is senior partner at Saracen and Partners, where he specializes in new business opportunities and the management of diversified multi-asset portfolios. For many years, Richard was head of their work with charities and author of Saracen's Companion Compendium of Investment, which I highly recommend to you as a model of data in this field. So we're covering a wide landscape and let's uh, dig right in. Uh, we've asked each of the uh, panelists to give us about five minutes as an opening statement. Tessa, do you want to kick us off? Thank you so much, uh, Susan, and it's a, a real pleasure to be here today and to be part of Philanthrothink and uh, know that you know the, this is uh, being widely viewed across uh, the, plat the Zoom platform. So, and such an important topic to take on. And so I really uh, applaud the MPNL for wanting to, to dive into this topic of uh, wise investment. And as you say, you're covering three main areas, impact investing, ESG, and responsible investing uh, across, the, across the panel today. So I'm going to really focus on responsible investing in, in my opening remarks and throughout the panel. Uh, leaving the other two areas to my fellow panelists. But what I wanted to start off by saying is that responsible investing, you know, I have been looking at this topic for almost 30 years. <laughs> I hate to date myself, but um, since the 1990s. And I've actually seen responsible investing move from uh, a, a tipping point from niche uh, to mainstream. And it's been very interesting to watch that movement. You know, we have a, 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 um, the principles for responsible investment or PRI, um, a set of six principles that asset owners and asset managers can sign on to. And currently there's over $110 trillion of assets under management have signed that set of principles around responsible investing. And uh, so that's what I mean by moving, um, you know, kind of moving the needle, uh, being um, on the mainstream now with responsible investing. Canada alone, the Responsible Investment Association uh, estimates that over $3 trillion, that's 60% of Canada's managed assets have an ESG 
uh, responsible investing lens. And, you know, when I started off in this topic in the 1990s and talking about uh, the, the, the ESG, environmental, social, and governance, uh, and these factors, those, these three factors were called non-financial. In other words, it was seen in the 1990s that these three elements uh, in our economy and affecting our companies uh, did not have financial implications. And, uh, and so I would be talking about, uh, about responsible investing or sometimes called socially responsible investing at that time. And um, I'd, I'd be being patted on the head. Now, you know, I was 30 years younger, so <laughs> I'd be being patted on the head. And, you know, we kind of, there, there, dear, don't worry your, your little head about these issues because the financial market is doing very well. And, um, uh, and then over the course of the last 20 years, we've had quite a number of um, crises and challenges in the financial market that have enabled investors and asset owners to see that this is uh, indeed a topic that, um, th that these things are not non-financial uh, and that they should be taken into account. And, um, and that's really, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about definitions, but, you know, just to kind of lay the groundwork for responsible investing, it is taking ESG factors into account in investment decision making. And, the, you know, it's not, it's not overly prescriptive on how you might want to take those into account. And, you know, if all that $110 trillion was going into impact, we'd actually be seeing more impact than we are today. But a lot of that, th those funds are actually um, using ESG to reduce risk in their portfolio. It's, a, it's seen sometimes as a risk reduction uh, strategy uh, rather than a, you know, seeking positive change. I'm going to let Richard and Christina talk more about uh, those two areas as we go forward. But I would just say that you know, currently, um, within those three factors, that the environment is the top uh, agenda item under consideration. Uh, it used to be, again, as ESG was coming forward, it used to be governance. Uh, and governance was seen to be the purvey of um, the asset owners and, and shareholders uh, and um, asset managers. But that G has been gradually replaced by the um, by the environment, and again, issues like uh, you know the climate crisis that we're under, the um, uh, severe uh, weather systems um, that we're facing around the world. Other issues are coming up: um, biodiversity, water uh, scarcity. And then I would say, uh, in addition to um, these issues, I'm seeing issues like uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, which we would consider an S in the ESG. And in the Canadian context, particularly um, Indigenous reconciliation as an issue that we're seeing more and more. But um, these, uh, these areas are, uh, are very um, topical. Uh, and what we're finding is more and more investment uh, asset owners, uh, uh, trustees, um, investment committees are spending their time uh, looking at these uh, challenges uh, that, that we're facing. And we're going to talk a little bit about obstacles, so I don't want to get into areas like greenwashing at the moment. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time, Susan, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, to my colleagues, uh, Richard and Christina. Well, Richard, we're delighted to have you with us to bring the international perspective because we're always conscious that living in a Canadian potentially bubble, we're missing uh, global trends or we don't have a full uh, appreciation of some of those trends. So Tessa gave you a natural uh, seg into uh, into ESG and related matters. Yeah. So I'm. Um... 
Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm honoured to be invited. I've, I've actually just got back from a week in Toronto, listening to talking to a whole range of foundations um, about these very things. Um, and, and I'm thrilled it's a subject matter that's getting just a, a much wider airing. I, I thought in my preamble, I would just do a tiny sort of journey of where we've been, because I think we are on a journey um and we're not finished and and i also think that journey different countries different people are in different places and we must recognize that and then i thought i'd make some opening comments and then just a few sort of um i don't know observations and challenges that might open up the conversation so i mean again you know i've been doing this for 30 years like tessa i'd like to think of myself as a responsible investor the other way of looking at it is i'd like to think i've been a good steward of our clients assets and i see it both from my side of the table as a practitioner, having run money for 30 years, but also I, I'm an investments committee member, chairman of an investments committee. So I see it from the, the asset owner point of view as well. And, you know, when we first started, it was all about streaming things out that simply cut against the ethos or the morals of the of the institutions. And that, that was quite easy. We then moved into more sort of generic E, S and G analysis, which for me is just, it's really trying to inform us about the, the qualities of the and the activities of the assets that we we own and then you know talking about portfolios tilted towards or simply being more more aware of the mission related investments that we might hold already in the portfolio or that we might want to lean in towards and then all the way into sort of fully impactful investments or assets where we might even be willing to um, receive a lower financial return quite possibly even a loss could be acceptable if when the thing was measured in the round, the loss or the lower financial return was more than offset by the, the quality and the quantum of the societal impact that you had achieved by using your money in that way. So it's been a big journey through those, those things. And I think my opening comments again on those four elements would be that exclusions are pretty well understood. You know, a good investment manager should be able to build ethical screens in to meet anybody's specific needs and also should be able to explain the consequences of any hard negative screens. Um, you know, I'm often asked, is it going to impact on performance? And after 30 years, all I will say is I think in the long run, no, the vast majority of negative screens don't make enough, don't make up enough of a world index to, for in the long term, for it either to be a good or a bad thing. I do think it can impact short term performance. I also think it, and it can impact both relative performance and absolute performance. I think that's perhaps less well understood, the alpha and beta and the way that works. But the bottom line is in the long run, exclusions are well understood and I don't think they take away from performance unless you take it to extremes. Um, the E, the S and the G is incredibly hot at the moment because they are considered in different ways by different fund managers. They are integrated into our research processes in very different ways. And whilst ethical screening is relatively simple to understand, that the way ESG considerations impact how fund managers actually pick one stock over another is much tougher to discern. Yet the levels of scrutiny and research between us all vary hugely. And quite frankly, there remains a lot of greenwashing and <clears throat> shall we say over-enthusiastic marketing material but it's actually incredibly hard to uncover the truth unless you are very clued up. You know, knowing which questions to ask to draw out the quality is really hard. And I think that is phenomenally frustrating for many buyers, many clients of, of investment management product. Um, also not helped now by the fact that there are some people who simply seem to think ESG is a bad thing. Um, and, and, and I'm quite uncomfortable about that. But, you know, we live in a world at the moment where two different rating systems or two different research systems can rate Coca-Cola as an A or a D. And that's a very peculiar place to be. Yeah, as soon as you get into mission aligned investment, I think that the waters get murkier still. You know, on the one hand, surely it makes sense to own more things that are aligned with your ultimate go goals than not. But on the other hand, you know, I'm still trying to achieve market returns. And I think we need to tread a very careful balance between risking capital and risking our reputations. Um, interestingly, my initial conclusion is that more of most people's portfolios are probably already missioned aligned than they might think. But that said, that is a conclusion I reach because of my 
personal interpretation of what alignment means, and many are going to disagree with that. And then lastly, impact investment. I think all I would say on that front at the moment is that the theory is, I think, sound. Uh, I think there are some excellent worked examples where combined financial and social outcomes have been better than could have been achieved by any other approach, either making money and spending it or giving it away. You know, I think problems have been solved and mitigated more effectively through some impact investments than, than anything else. Um, however, I am also aware of quite a lot of capital that has been written off. And I think a lot of the British charities we see have been um, positively um, surprised by the amount of impact they've had with their impact investments and perhaps negatively surprised by how much money they've actually got back from them. But I also think it's very early days. So I am really keen that lots of people do impact investment. Um, but for a long term investor, it's still quite unproven. Um, so I'm happy that others step boldly and I want to watch it. But I just urge a little bit of caution based on what I've seen. Some final observations winding it all up. If I had four points that I think are worth discussion, the first is simply transparency. Um, make absolutely sure that you say no more or less than you are doing and that everybody is on message. I see too much reputational damage um, by people not being truly transparent about what they're doing. Um, joined up thinking. Don't undo with the left hand what your right hand is doing. Try and be consistent across your asset classes and thoughtful in the way that you apply your views, because we see a lot of inconsistency and in not joined up thinking. My point about this is a journey. This is a journey. The levels of understanding, the different approaches, the vocabulary, the taxonomy, the regulation, people's perception and knowledge are all at very different places. This is not an easy subject. Um, and critically, I think if we want responsible investment and mission aligned stewardship to evolve, we need to embrace everybody. For me, education is the key and is likely to result in more progress than evangelism, which just frightens some people away. And then lastly, the raging debate for me at the moment on all of this is the moral and financial benefits of ownership engagement and activism versus just not owning the bad stuff. You know, is this black? Is it white? Is it gray? And I'd love to have a bigger conversation about what is the right approach, a perfect portfolio today or a portfolio that's less than perfect that we make better. And again, so I, I think I'll leave it there. Oh, there's so much in there to uh, to unpack. Thanks. But Christina, and thank you for, for giving to it. Uh, Christina, your, your opening marks, and then we have uh, a lot to dig into. Sure. Thanks so much, Susan. I'm really thrilled to be here on this panel uh, with my colleagues and uh, just very excited for this topic today. My perspective is coming from the philanthropic world as a foundation, but I will share that um, I, my experience before that was with the nonprofit sector. So I did work for 16 years as an, as an executive director of various environmental charities and nonprofits. And so um, that was the perspective I came into the MPNL program uh, that Susan mentioned when I, when I joined. So I just wanna do a huge plug uh, to the MPNL. It's the 10th anniversary of that program. I'm a very proud graduate of the program and feel like it brings a lot of context and strength uh, to this sector in Canada and, and allows us to contribute to these important conversations um, globally. And, uh, and so in that work with the MPNL is where I really explored the philanthropy side of MPNL. And, uh, and that's really what brought me into the foundation world. And so now I'm, I'm leading a Canadian foundation, Sustainable Capacity Foundation, and as many other foundations are doing, exploring the opportunity for impact investing is really um, what's, what's really pressing on our investment committee and on our uh, board's mind these days. So I'm excited to see uh, how that is, uh, is emerging. Um, Tessa's talked about sort of over 30 years uh, a transition in terms of responsible investing. And I, and I wouldn't say that we're quite uh, there on the impact investing side for sure. Um, I personally have been involved in different impact investments over the last 20 years. And the last five specifically have been really heating up in terms of uh, what's available. Um, in fact, maybe so much that we're seeing conversations now and trends in the sector worrying about greenwashing um, and that kind of thing in relation to impact investing themselves. So I'm really excited. I'll keep my remarks short for the beginning because I really want to jump into this great conversation. Um, but I'm, I am super passionate about the opportunity that impact investing brings. I know, Richard, you just commented about maybe 
Uh, we need more caution. Uh, I'm of the opposite mindset. And I say, let's boldly jump in and, uh, and take risks as philanthropy, where others maybe can't take those kinds of risks, where pension funds may, may be having to weigh different considerations. I feel like there's opportunities within uh, the philanthropic sector where we can boldly go into impact investing in a deeper way that others may not be. So, uh, so, I'll, I'll, say, so I'll leave it there for now and, uh, and add some more comments later. Okay. Thanks to the three of you. Let's let's start with some basics just to make sure that we're we're understood of the con concepts. How would you define each of these and how would you differentiate them, if at all, of impact investing, responsible investing, and ESG? Richard, do you want to take a stab at, at one of those or all of them? Yeah, and, and I'll can I, can I do the ESG one from a and I'm going to say I'm going to take it from an asset manager's point of view because it really, really annoys me when um, people wrap ESG investment up into, oh, the only people who do that. And forgive, I'm going to use some pejorative words here. You're a bunch of tree huggers. You're liberal lefties. That's what ESG is for. I fundamentally disagree with that. For me, building environmental, social, and governance factors into your financial analysis, going back to something Tessa said, the idea that this is not financially critical to me is just bonkers. For, for me, building ESG into the way that you manage money and pick stocks, it's basically seeking and valuing the potential impact of unfunded externalities, bad operating practices, unsound governance, and weak products. And you're doing these things to try and find things out before the market becomes aware of them. Because all of those things, if you do not spot them, will lose you money. So my starting point is that good ESG analysis completely integrated into all the other types of financial analysis you're doing, and they have to be bonded and embedded together, is all about trying to avoid unpleasant surprises that will lose you money. Now, at the same time, of course, what you're also doing is promoting a fairer thing, a more just where you're doing all of those things so you rest at peace that you are changing the world in a good way from the inside you're doing good and if you get these companies to become better companies you make more money other people will embrace them and you've caused good along the way that the notion that you can separate it so i'm i'm a capitalist in in this regard i just think this is good fund management i think it is good stewardship of your clients assets and, and I can't bear it where I'm, where, where I'm told that, that, as I say, that this isn't mainstream asset management, which is why people like us embraced it 15 and more years ago, because we thought it would be a better way to make money in a more responsible way. You know, it ticks all the boxes. And, and I've got a number of worked examples where doing the sort of high quality, I'm, I'm going to say in-depth ESG analysis brackets, it's got to be primary work because none of the ratings agencies out there, when you dig into it, I think are doing it particularly properly. Um, if, if you do it properly, we've definitively avoided some unpleasant things, both financially, but also reputationally. It's also allowed us a much higher quality of engagement with the companies we work with because you're having a higher quality conversation and asking questions that not everybody is asking them. So I think, you know, is that an answer? So for me, the environmental, social and governance aspects of investment management are, are mission critical for everybody, whether you believe in it or not. So that and that's coming from a fund manager, not the environmentalist or the social activist or, or the governance specialists. I'm going to jump in uh, around the definition on responsible investing uh, and um, uh, basically, uh, as I've already touched on, the, the definition of responsible investing is taking those ESG that Richard has just d defined, the environmental, social and governance factors, into account in investment decision making. One of the things that's interesting about responsible investing is it's not is that there are many ways, many different strategies that uh, asset owners and asset managers can use in terms of taking ESG into account. And um, I, I sometimes describe these as, you know, there, there can be passive strategies. And here I would talk about 
proxy voting. You, you know, every um, shareholder has the right to vote a proxy on at the annual general meeting. And it's actually quite important how proxies are voted. Uh, and this is one of the easiest strategies that responsible investors can get started with is, is asking their managers, how are you voting the proxies? And um, a good example uh, is, uh, is a, um, a, a, um, a foundation that I'm on the investment committee of, the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. Uh, and Catherine Donnelly Foundation just put forward a minority shareholder resolution uh, on Starbucks and their treatment of workers that went to the annual general meeting in, in uh, this last spring. And uh, uh, very interesting, that resolution passed. And it's extremely rare, as, as Richard would know, for minority shareholder resolutions to actually pass. Uh, but it's quite important when you see, okay, so in, uh, many, the majority of the proxies were voted in favor of that resolution. So proxy voting is, is a very, uh, is a bit of a passive strategy. More active strategies are things like minority shareholder resolutions or engaging directly with company management. Uh, and um, uh, but th then it can either be noisy or it can be quiet. And um, I know my experience in the UK, Richard might uh, say that this has changed, is that a lot of that engagement is quiet behind closed doors and not reported on, which is one of the things about talking about disclosure of what you're actually doing, um, rather than uh, keeping it all, you know, hush, hush. It, it can be noisy though, because there's these focus lists. Um, some of the big um, active responsible investors put out focus lists of companies that they're not happy about uh, the way in which um, they may be dealing with, with some of these issues. And to, to you know, build on something that, um, that Richard said, it can be negative. In other words, it can screen out things that you don't want to have in your portfolio, or it can be positive and look for opportunities where you want to advance something in the, op in, in the portfolio. And I guess for, for many of us, this engagement strategy um, is uh, you know, opportunistic in the sense that you're seeking to hold the company and improve uh, it's um, the, the way in which it uh, is handling um, and raising the standards on ESG uh, with the companies that, um, that are owned. And the last thing I would say about responsible investing is that it's rooted in the long term. You know, if you're a day trader and you're just uh, trading in and out of a position over the course of a day or even a week, you're not going to overly care about ESG. But if you're a long-term investor, which most of our large investors are, uh, you're going to hold that position for quite a period of time. And as a long-term investor, you take on more and more risk if the ESG standards of a company are, are low. Um, it also uses the rights of shareholders. And I know sometimes for other stakeholders in, in our uh, overall uh, capitalist economy, uh, they would see shareholders as overprivileged, but it does use the rights of shareholders to uh, ask for disclosure, to ask for companies uh, to tell about how they, they're, they're raising their standards in these, um, in, in these ways. So it, it, responsible investing has a couple of these unique characteristics that uh, enable it to be quite, quite powerful uh, as a lever in our economy for these higher standards. Can, can I, I just want to agree with something Tessa said, which is the whole trick with this. If it's about actually trying to change things, you've got to know when to be quiet and when to be loud. And you're absolutely right. There are moments when to actually get something to happen, you have to allow people to get off their high horse, as it were, round behind the bike sheds, and then lead the back the, the horse back onto the stage and say it was all their idea. And actually, that's probably after two years of quiet engagement. And if that's what's needed to happen to make it change, fine by me. 
but you've also got to know when to make it loud. And one of the most fun things we've had in terms of making it loud is the the very public letter written in our case, it's the FT, but it could be in the, you know, somewhere where the chief exec, exec is going to see it. And you don't just sign it by the grey fund managers. You actually get, we get our clients to sign these letters too, because your point about shareholders are seen to be rich, silly people. Actually, when the letters are signed by some of the biggest charities out there, the biggest foundations, the biggest universities, actually, maybe the chief execs, they don't mind giving me a hard time, but do they really want to embarrass themselves in front of the, this public money? And particularly if you're writing to a chairman and you can find that the charity local to his home in his neighborhood has signed the letter. I, I'm sorry, you know, that by fair means and foul sometimes to, to get proper disclosure on what's going on. And then the last point is, I think the cleverest thing is often not engaging with management, but finding another lever. Often the audit companies nowadays, um, you know, if you want to really go after a company and get something changed, you go to the auditor and point out to them that you won't be seeing the management team if they don't change the practices or the quality of their report and accounts. You'll sue the auditor. And of course, the auditors often have much shallower pockets than the very, very mega corporations. Um, and we've had significant success writing down balance sheets to more realistic levels by approaching the auditors and challenging them rather than the management team. So there are so many ways of achieving what you want to achieve. But your point about quietness doesn't necessarily mean nothing's going on. Quietness is often a lot is going on in the background to make something happen. And, and I loved your point about long and short-term investors. It's also management teams don't respect short-term investors. If they think you're going to trade out within five minutes, they're not really going to listen to you and engage with you because you'll be gone but they will listen to people who are there for the long haul. So I think long-term investors, and that's where charities come in because we're so multi-generational. We really are in it for the long haul. So I'm gonna jump in and talk about impact investment and defining it. Uh, impact investing is the intentional investment for both financial returns and positive environmental and social impact. The key uh, about impact investing is that it's measurable and that it's measured. And it's also an extension of responsible investing. So I just want to emphasize here that the intentionality is what is really important when it comes to impact investing. And that's what uh, really distinguishes it. But I want, want to put it a bit more into practical terms from a philanthropic point of view, because that's what I'm interested in as a foundation um, manager. And what does it mean for us as foundations, the idea of impact investing? Well, traditionally, when we talk about how foundations can have impact, we're often talking about their granting opportunities. So if you're a $100 million foundation and within your disbursement quota or your DQ, you're giving out $5 million in grants every year, we might be focused on what kind of impact that $5 million is having out in the community where those grants are being given. But impact investing is a window to a whole new world of impact in the sense that it looks more at the assets within the foundation itself. So that 100 million or 95, if it was a bad year, a million, whatever is there, um, is, uh, is an opportunity to really unlock it and put it into work for, for the sector and for good. So whether it's on affordable housing or social justice issues or whether it's within um, sustainable buildings, there are many uh, even, even safe and secure opportunities that can, that can be pursued within impact investing. But it's about unlocking a whole new set of capital that traditionally has not been looked at uh, within foundations uh, for, for more active investments. So that's just my comment there on impact investing. It really helps clarify. Thank you all. In some way, all of you talked about this being a journey. Um, Tessa, you talked about moving from, from niche to mainstream. What are the drivers? Just so we understand what's the driver, what's driving the, the interest, the, the trends in impact responsible investing in ESG. What should be, what should be looking to it, aware of? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first on, on this one, uh, Susan. I think um, the, the, there's a range of drivers around uh, the, these three approaches. The, um, you know, for responsible investing, I think that as we've had some major crises in the financial market, uh, particularly a 2008 financial crisis, 
a lot of uh, investment committees and, and trustees said, wow, everything that we've been told about the market and how the market works doesn't necessarily hold when we have the, these, um, you know, black, sometimes called black swan or un, uh, unexpected events. I mean, COVID, you know, I've gone back to 2008, but COVID would be another example, something that was completely unexpected. And we see the, the, the markets having to take these, um, you know, quite large uh, downward trajectories that helps people to say, you need to have this more holistic view of the whole uh, economy in order to really think about um, where you're, you're going to reduce risk in your portfolio and what you want to drive, what positive things you want to drive forward. Um, so, you know, you could say that coining the term responsible investment was, uh, you know, who, who, who doesn't want to be a responsible investor, right? So, so there, was, there was an element where the language um, it also propels, uh, people, you know, the, the, or the, the, the whole trend in, in this direction forward. Um, some changes in, in government regulation. Uh, so, so government does have a role to play. Uh, has also driven um, more attention to the ESG uh, components. And then around impact, I've thought that the uh, sustainable development goals has been another big driver because you see more and more foundations, endowments, um, pension plans, other institutional investors who are aligning investment with the SDG and SDGs. And for me, that's very positive because what they're saying is, well, you know, we have all these financial assets, but how can they make that positive change in the world that the SDGs represent? So, um, you know, they say that, you know, and this was quite a few years ago that we needed $4 trillion a year to meet the goals. Um, I think now we're up to $7 trillion a year to meet the goals. And there's no governments or, um, or philanthropic organizations who have that kind of, those kinds of resources. And so the SDGs, and if you look on most large institutional investors' websites, for example, or asset managers, you will see some reference, I, I think, both to responsible investing and to SDG alignment. Uh, uh, yeah, I can dive in. I, I think this is a fascinating one. You know, why, why have we been on a journey and why is it speeding up right now? And, and I think there have been some you know, lightning bolts in the past 10 or 15 years that there's just a, you know, there's a realization that some really bad practices have slowly crept into the world. Um, you know, regulation consistently seems to fight the last war, but is not prepared for the next war. Governments, I think, are running scared of big corporates and have been for a long time and are not helped by the fact that most governments are in position for five years and then they move on. So they're not long termists. They're about the now. And they've totally failed. Government has let us down in some regards in things like climate change. So weak regulation, I think weak governance, um, incredibly dispersed ownership of shares millions of people owning shares in one company. And what that has meant is that there's been a phenomenal power transfer over the past hundred years of control has gone from the asset owners who were long-termists to the managers who are short-termists and quite frankly have, have raped some businesses for their immediate gain. And I think that has just steadily broke, you know, built up, built up until you can argue seven, eight, nine, we virtually broke the system. And we've also virtually broken the environment. And there are a whole load of social and indigenous and diversity and inclusion issues as well that have all just, if not fallen by the wayside, risen up the agenda appropriately. So I think all of these things bubbling together have made us acutely aware that asset owners have got to step back into the fray because we are the, we're, we're the interested party. It's, it's our assets that are going to get wasted away or abused, or we're going to have the assets and we're not going to have a planet to spend them on. Now, you build all that into a, a, a next generation thing. I think every generation that comes along cares more and more about this. You have to acknowledge that youth 
has actually been a phenomenal driver of a lot of this. And the youth is now appearing on trustee boards and in investment management companies, and they care. And they're looking at the previous generations and saying, quite frankly, guys, you didn't care enough, and we want to right some of these wrongs. And then the last one is the results, because I think an awful lot of investors who've embraced these things earlier than others have actually produced quite good financial returns. And then you come back to some of the things that Christina was saying. You can't not say that there are hundreds of billions of dollars of capital in the charitable sector across the world. But an awful lot of things simply have never been solved. So I like the idea that we, you know, if it's not working, let's try some different ways of doing it. So, Christina, when, you know, I am, I think it's fantastic that some people want to be bolder than I do when it comes to impact investment, because it needs some boldness. I'm just saying I don't want to see generations of capital swept away in 10 years of heroic sort of um, too much too soon. But that is definitively not to say that we don't need some leaders in the field. And I get most excited. But your point about measurement is so critical because I'd also like to see the, the sort of quality of impact measurement that's going into impact type investments being applied some of the grant giving because i tend to think you measure it more when you've given your capital away if you're just giving your five percent away a year and you'll know there'll be another five percent next year and you're never expecting it back i'm not sure all grant giving's impact is measured perhaps as well as it should be and i rather hope that the measurement techniques that will be used to prove the power of impact in impact investment will actually seep across into all grant giving and a real questioning amongst trustees as to how we can apply our assets to best achieve our objectives. So I'm excited by this. And I do think we are at a, an inflection point. It's been building for 15 or 20 years. And I think we're here now. And that excites me because I think it will, it will build a better world. I really do. That takes us to a very practical question of assuming you're a, a, a trustee, a member of, of an investment committee, and you want to move your, your organization into impact responsible investing what kind of questions should you ask or what kinds of principles would you take into account to move your organization forward because uh, as Tessa said at the beginning often this was seen impact and, and responsible because we're seen as risky as not not providing the the, the return that quote traditional would so what kind of guidance would you give to to uh, trustees moving forward in this space. Christina, do you want to kick that off? Sure. Yeah. And I see this question a lot as I'm talking to different foundations and, uh, and in particular, as there's such a growing interest within the philanthropic community in Canada in particular, um, uh, there is a lot more excitement and conversation about how this can be actually operationalized within different foundations. So the first thing I'm seeing a lot of is this movement by different boards of directors to adopting an impact investment policy. And so really understanding what, what types of investments um, you would want to align with and also what percentage of, of your assets, of your endowment that you might put towards this. Uh, many are just dipping their toe into the water for the very small, you know, three to five percent of their overall endowment to see what this is all about. And then on the other hand, you have these incredible leading foundations in Canada. I'll name a few, uh, the Lawson Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, McConnell Foundation, the InSpirit Foundation, and Tessa has already mentioned Catherine Donnelly Foundation. Not to leave anybody out, but there's some incredible foundations in Canada that are really leading the way. And they're so open and generous to share with other foundations that process. So I sit on the Impact Investment Committee at the Laidlaw Foundation. We've been going through a journey and we're learning from others as to how we can make those uh, impactful investments and how we can establish uh, policies and how we can also grow our impact. So I think that there are some really tangible uh, things that need to be done, like establishing a formal um, impact investment policy, and then also uh, determining what the risk level and comfort level is of the investment committee um, to, uh, to determine. In our case at Laidlaw, we established an impact investment subcommittee that reports back up to the IC uh, in terms of making decisions around impact investment. So those are just some practical ideas that come to mind. I'm, I'm going to add, I'm going to add to um, Christina's list. I mean, I, uh, I absolutely think 
for um, for trustees uh, and uh, investment committees that they need to start with their investment beliefs and really think through how they see um, environmental, social, and governance, uh, what they believe um, uh, that uh, these three um, factors, uh, how they're going to impact their por the, the portfolio, and then moving that into, as, as Christina said, the, the, the policy, the statement of investment policy of the organization, and often setting targets, uh, both for responsible investing and for uh, impact investing, and then measuring, measuring whether those targets are being met. Um, I think of uh, impact investing in, and um, responsible investing as being a lens. Neither of them are an asset class. They are a lens that the investor uses uh, to, to um, apply those standards to all their investments uh, across the portfolio. And the other thing that I wanted to add is that, um, and I know that uh, for those who are involved in the philanthropic sector uh, and, um, uh, and are on this webinar, um, that for most uh, foundations and endowments, you are asset owners and you use asset managers to manage your um, endowments and your assets. And so, we, all along, since since this movement started, the asset owner has been seen as key to um, moving the asset manager. And so, even if the asset owner only has you know a few million dollars, they still may have an external uh, asset manager that they are going to ask questions of. They should be seeing their asset managers you know once a year. And they should take that as an opportunity to ask a set of questions on um, ESG, on responsible investing, on impact investing. And um, there are online and you know, a number of toolkits where you can see as a trustee, what are the questions that you should be asking your asset managers? And the other thing is, and I, I know Richard wants to get in because you also like in order to move an asset manager, you have to incentivize them. What is in it for them? What is the mandates that they are going to um, win uh, in, 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 if they have these components uh, that they're meeting? And there was a, a really great opportunity um, and I know Christina was a part of this, the Great Canadian ESG uh, Championship uh, that Trottier Foundation, McConnell Foundation, and eight other foundations came together, pooled $90 million of uh, assets into an ESG mandate, and then asked the big money managers uh, the, 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 to, um, to respond to this. Uh, and to provide the best, um, the, you know, the best proposals that they could to win these, the, the, this mandate. It was spread over quite a number of different asset managers, but, you know, Manulife was one, Alpha Fix was another, UBS, uh, Rally Assets. Um, I'm just naming a few of the ones that were awarded this ESG mandate, but it enabled the asset managers to see that the asset owners were absolutely serious about ESG uh, and having these components in their portfolio. And that's a perfect opening to Richard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's lovely because actually we, we asked if we could compete in the Canadian ESG Olympics. And sadly, we were told it was only open to Canadian competitors um, <laughs> because we, you know, we, we, I, I thought it was pretty cool and I wanted to be part of it. Um, I, I, I'd say two things. To, to what Christina said, um, I, I love working in a sector where people are willing to talk to each other. Um, one of the things I was doing in Canada last week was just hoovering up lots of information for Canadian charities who were willing to take the time to talk to me. And, and it's a two-way street. I think I, I left them with some thoughts of things they could do better, but I definitively took things back to U the UK that I thought we could do better. And I think impact investment is certainly an area where 
my first thing is if you want to do more of it, educate yourselves and go and talk to the people who are already doing it because they will be free to give you your time. And actually, if you can get on a plane and come to the UK, I can assure you the big UK charities, and I could reel off 10 or 11 names who've led the field with some serious assets, they will talk to you. So learn from other people's experience because if you need to educate the um, the less forward thinking members of your investments committee or trustee board. For me, it's all about education. And that starts with a big conversation and just sharing all the information. And there is a lot of information now to share. The, the, the site downer is, is sort of touching on something Tessa said, which is on the one hand positive. I, I wouldn't appoint an asset manager that didn't have a really strong ESG framework around everything that they do. And I think you absolutely should expect that of the industry. I think the impact thing is much tougher. Sorry, and I should say in the middle, I think alignment can also be done by asset managers. I think the problem with impact is the, specific, the specificity to each charity's particular charitable objectives makes it quite hard to scale. Because if you are a homeless charity in Toronto, the only things that you can do are to empower homeless people in Toronto. Doing it in Calgary or Vancouver really doesn't help you. That would not be aligned with your mission. And, and we have struggled trying to find a generic way to do impact within an investment management company. And the most successful impact investments I've seen have mostly been done by charities themselves because they are best placed to measure and understand the impact and, and how to achieve it. And, and I think that's awkward at the moment. And I'm not saying we're not still trying to find ways to think of the most generic charitable objectives where we could build up the scale to make it worth our while. But that's just an honest appraisal of ESG and alignment. We should be doing absolutely impact. We're going to find tougher because of the scalability and the specificity of it. But I don't think that I don't think that there's a point that you know, that homeless uh, organization in Toronto is going to run out of affordable housing opportunities for impact investing. And I think the same is true with the climate crisis. There's just such a deepness to these uh, problems that we're facing in Canada around affordable housing, the climate crisis, and and uh, and so many other issues that that there we are just scratching the surface but when agreed. it comes to what's possible. No, completely agreed. But you don't want an investment manager really charging you a fee, sitting in between you and the building you bought. You can do that yourselves. Because what I also don't want to do is just harvest a fee out of something that would be done better and cheaper by the charities themselves. But climate crisis, absolutely, there's a whole range of things, and that is scalable. And in fact, I would argue that many foundations can be doing a lot more themselves and don't necessarily always have to work through an asset manager to be able to invest very directly in uh, in the sector as well. The, the, the other thing I think is quite amusing is when I get told by people who don't believe in any form of impact investment is, is I take much glee sometimes pointing out that actually they're one of the biggest impact investors I know. And they look at you and, and what we've never made an impact invest, investment. We don't have any impact investments. And if you're having this discussion with a school, a hospice, a church, anybody who has a place where they do their business out of, somebody at some point decided to use their money to build the church, to build the hospice, um, to build the the whatever it might be you know the biggest asset of the University of Toronto is the land that they own in Toronto they could suddenly up sticks and sell all their land and do online learning and suddenly have an endowment fund that's the world's biggest endowment fund and just send everybody to other people's universities and pay them scholarships I'm a trustee of St Paul's Cathedral technically I'm sitting on about two billion pounds worth of real estate in the city um, which was purchased for peanuts several hundred years ago but somebody took the decision to build a church that's actually, if we marked its value to market, being a phenomenally good land investment, but actually we've had the social impact by being a place of worship. Now, I'm not suggesting we sell St. Paul's Cathedral, but we have seen quite a lot of schools in the UK shut down because they weren't having good educational impact, turn themselves into an endowment fund and send local children to much better schools elsewhere. So I love having this conversation when people say they don't do impact, they don't believe in it, and pointing out to them that they're already doing a lot of it they have assets that are actively having impact in society and they've made an active decision to do that to, to cut their total asset base up that way we want to come to an issue that uh, a way of thinking about this that that we're seeing more of and that might seem like a, a relatively easy solution for example in universities 
there's certainly pressure from, from many student bodies to say, we shouldn't invest in X, we shouldn't invest in fossil fuels, extractive industries, et cetera. Is that, uh, is that good guidance for, for responsible investing? Uh, and at the beginning, Richard, you talked about uh, joined up thinking, which perhaps you could explain to us as, as part of that. So should, I, should we be saying we're just not, we're not in those, in those kinds of, uh, of areas? Uh, we'll put our money elsewhere. What's yeah. your advice on that? You, you, I'm pained by this, and I have been for a little while, because I fear that I, we, who believe what I'm about to say, we're losing the debate. I understand why we're losing it, but I, I, I am strongly the opinion that in most instances, I don't want to own a perfect portfolio. But I think I will make more money and do more social good owning bad things and making them better. Brackets, there comes a point when if you're not making something better, you need to walk away. So it's not divestment or engagement. It's a combination of the two. But I think you have to try to engage before you totally divest. Because, of course, once you've divested, if all the good people ultimately divest, this bad stuff is owned by bad people who won't want to do it any better. And the world won't get any better. And these companies will continue to do bad things in bad ways. And I think the oil and gas and the whole fossil fuels and climate debate is, is the focus point of this at the moment, because I think a lot of um, educational establishments, universities, who would hold them up as leading academic thinkers, I think a lot of them agree that the best way forward is probably one of at least partial engagement and partial use your money to cause change. However, they are under such intense pressure from people simply to divest that many of them have just chosen to divest themselves of their fossil fuels. And we're losing a lot of good money from, from the argument, which is going to make it easier for the bad companies to continue to do bad things. But what then really infuriates me, and this is what I mean about a lack of joined up thinking, is they sell the extractive industries but continue to own car companies and electricity generation companies and companies using plastics. You know, all they're doing is getting rid of the people who dig it out of the ground, but continuing to own all the people who are doing the damage by burning it inefficiently too much where they don't have to be. And I find it peculiar that you wouldn't own an oil company, but you would own a, a car company um, or an electricity generation company. Um, or a company using large amounts of power that is being generated from fossil fuels. Joined up thinking for me is if you are so of the mindset that you won't touch any of this, you shouldn't touch any of it from the people who dig it out of the ground to the people who burn it. And you should also not drive a car yourself and not travel. Yeah, it, I think there are some real inconsistencies here. And, and I rather wish that at times that the student population had been a bit less vocal and a bit more long-termist and thoughtful. And I'm going to get myself into real danger selling this because, or, or, or saying this, but I think it's just a shame that a lot of our leading establishments have just gone down, I think, this oversimplified divestment route. Um, because I don't think it's helpful to the wider cause. In fact, I think it will slow down change. Um, now, in the UK, we are seeing a little bit of a change because some of the most robust um, haters of anything to do with fossil fuels are beginning to say, look, we've caused the, the discussion we wanted to cause by behaving the way we behaved. So that's fantastic. It is now absolutely on everybody's agenda. And we have a lot of investors who invested in what I call a Paris aligned way and that they were trying to cause change. But I mean, I, I think I've gone around this subject. I can comment. But yeah, I, I'm frustrated that, that, that I'm going to say the lack of joined up thinking and the way in which I think people who could have been incredibly helpful to cause change have effectively just washed their hands as a part of the problem. And, and okay. I get it, because if I was a chancellor who was driving my car into the university and, and we're having eggs chucked at it every day, and in one case I had a chancellor who every Monday morning he'd wake up and find his car had had buckets of paint poured all over it. I totally get that he doesn't want that to happen. And by selling the fossil fuel companies, it doesn't happen anymore. So I get why they've done it, but I don't think it stands up to too much intellectual scrutiny. I think it's a shame. I, yes, on, on many of, of Richard's points, I, I agree because I think that divestment 
is a really blunt instrument. It actually doesn't um, give instructions to the company as, as what you would want them to do. And we know in the Canadian context, we're, we're in a transition, uh, uh, emphasis on the word transition to a low carbon economy. We need to be sending messages to our oil and gas sector that tells them we are on a, a, a path to a low carbon economy. And what that means is that we are going to use carbon in the most efficient way possible. And we're going to stop using it in inefficient ways that is just adding to the climate crisis. And there's many things that can be done in terms of shifting to this greater efficiency in fossil fuel. I mean, as we move to a low carbon economy, there's still going to be carbon in the mix. Uh, there, there are many things that will require um, that use. Do we, should we be burning coal for electrical generation? Absolutely not. That's a very inefficient use of carbon. And so we have to have the engagement with the oil and gas sector, particularly in Canada. You know, it's, it's a huge part of our economy. And um, we need to work with government uh, and with the companies on how to make this transition. And we have a, a, an interesting instrument that's just come forward in the last, um, in the last month, uh, which is the taxonomy for the transition to a low carbon economy. And what this is, this is from the Canadian uh, Sustainable Finance Action Council, which was set up by the federal government uh, and represents about 60 of our biggest institutional investors. And they have put forward a roadmap for how to look at investments that move toward the transition to a low, com uh, low carbon economy. And uh, things like measuring the carbon footprint of one's portfolio um, is very important. Uh, I think almost all investors should be doing this because what you want to do is say, okay, here's our footprint, here's our carbon footprint from all of our investments today. How are we going to reduce that as we go, reduce that footprint as we go forward in the future. So it's a combination of yes, uh, you might sell off um, a coal. In fact, you should because uh, public, public coal companies have lost enormous amounts of money over the last uh, five years or so. Um, and you're sending a much more nuanced message uh, to companies uh, about what you want to see. And in fact, I'm part of a group called Climate Engagement Canada, which has 40 of our largest institutional investors uh, in this uh, coalition, engaging with the largest 40 um, CO2 emitters in Canada. So th that's an example of looking for opportunities where you can be part of a larger group that has a very big voice uh, that group includes Canada's banks, uh, to move companies in this positive direction. It, 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 everything you said is just so spot on, you know, and, and you've got to give companies the ability to go from pariah to transformational energy company. And, and where that happens, I'd like to see shareholders who've exited getting back on board. Because you're not going to get companies to change. If they're just going to be pariahs for the next 20 years, what is the incentive to change? If, on the other hand, they start doing good things and more people start backing them, and that improves their rating. And you know, the joined up thinking, you mentioned banks. I, I can't help but say, you know, how can you not, how can you sell all your old companies and then go and own a bunch of banks who are allowing them to borrow and lend and allowing them to do all their financial transactions? That's what I mean about joined up thinking. You know, we've sold all our BP, our Shell, our Canadian oil companies, but we own RBC, JP Morgan, HSBC. I just don't get that. 
I just want to echo what you have said about divestment, but also give a slightly different perspective. I feel like the divestment movement in Canada, as an example, is has really enabled um, enabled people to become much more engaged and aware of where money is going. And so to that extent, it's been a driver for change. And now there's more call for going deeper. I don't think divestment goes far enough. I completely agree with what you said, uh, Richard, but I think uh, on the on the positive side, it really created a bit of a movement. And now you have some really great initiatives such as the Canadian Philanthropic Commitment on Climate Change. I wanna do a quick plug for that uh, because both with my EFC Environment Funders Canada hat on as well as working with Philanthropic Foundations Canada. That's a really great initiative that's helping to move the needle when it comes to philanthropic commitment. And there are some rigorous um, concepts around impact investing within that framework. Great. I want to go to a question from um, from our audience, and if you uh, if you do have other questions, please put them in the in the Q and A. And and all of you in some ways talked about the inconsistencies. But the question is, out of the ESG rating systems out there, which ones are the most credible, and and what criteria would you uh, use to decide in which ratings are in fact uh, better than others? Any advice on on that? Uh I don't want to name and shame brands, as it were, and I saw the lady asked about a couple of specific ones, both of which I know. I'm, I'm just going to be blunt and say none of them are perfect, and they're all actually far from perfect. And when you understand how they reach their decisions and critically how the people at the companies they are asking to sort of complete their spreadsheets to come up with the ratings, how they're reacting. You know, a lot of these people are being asked so many questions by so many people, by so a lot of the companies are being asked so many questions by the rating agencies, by 500 fund managers. They are now swamped with ESG questions coming in to the extent that they often don't fill in all the boxes. They don't know the answers themselves. And often if the box isn't ticked, it doesn't get a bad reaction on the way the algorithm then works out the end rating. So but, but the, the bottom line is I simply can't recommend anybody relies on any mass marketed index or rating system. All the best fund managers, and there are quite a few of them nowadays, they use these, but it's shorthand and they're all doing seriously grown up fundamental primary research. You know, little old Saracen, uh, our matrix that we use, we ask 140 to 150 questions across the E, the S, the G, five subcategories for each. It's 150 primary questions. And we dig and dig and dig at the companies until we get the answers. And, and that's not just us. Our best competitors and peers are doing the same sort of thing. So I, I, I am very worried that the shorthand of this fund gets an MSCI rating of X or that fund manager gets a Bloomberg rating of Y. I go back to my point. I know that Coca-Cola is rated A on, on a scale of, let's say, A to E, where A is brilliant and E is egregious. I see the same companies being rated as A and E. And and also it goes back to, let's say you had, let, let's take one, you know, you mentioned Bloomberg, but I might say MSCI, but let's say we, because MSCI I know much better. They might rate one fund a B plus and they might rate another fund a D. But which is morally the better fund to own? I go back to, do you want a, a fund that is mostly good companies already cleaned up, which can't get much better? Or do you want to own a fund with a fund manager that starts at D, but they're consistently getting the companies rated upwards? And actually, by the time they get to B, they sell them and they go back to the bottom and buy another D to turn it into a B. The notion that A is better than C, I don't necessarily agree with that. So there are lots of rating agencies out there. None of them are perfect. And if you really want ESG properly done, the first trigger to say whether the manager is doing it well or properly is whether they say they totally rely on one of these agencies or whether they do their own primary work because if they say they rely on it i just walk to the next door yes. i i agree with i agree with richard it's it really the 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 top level ratings uh, of companies there's so much disparity between the different rating agencies depending on how you know what they looked at and uh, 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 that it's very difficult to say well, you know, one's more credible than the, than the next. It, they do provide you with a snapshot. And I do think that looking at a, a single rating agency, it's changes over time uh, of a company can also give a good, interesting snapshot. 
But what I would say is that um, really it's the underlying uh, data that's quite important. And I would kind of call out two things in particular, both actually on the climate issue, uh, the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, that's a question that can be asked of companies. Can you tell us how you are reporting on the greenhouse gas protocol? The carbon disclosure project is another one where a, a direct question can be asked about their reporting uh, to the um, carbon disclosure. And the, the third one is this task force on uh, climate-related financial disclosure. You'll note, Susan, I'm really avoiding the acronyms. Uh, so the, the, the TCFD, for those who've heard that acronym and, and didn't know what it stood for, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, it, it again um, asks for some concrete uh, undertakings from the company around uh, what they're doing on climate. Uh, and um, and these give you much better insight than a top level uh, A, B, or C uh, from the rating agencies. Thank you. We're, we're down to our uh, last five minutes. Ah. So, <laughs> it's gone quickly. This is the last time. Very brief, but looking ahead, very briefly, what do you see as the, the risks, the challenges? There's now a backlash against uh, ESG. Where do you see, what, what should we be watching for as we continue on this journey? Christina, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think we have to remember that not all foundations have taken this move uh, from a from a from an impact investing point of view. I think, I think many of them, if not all of them, have moved along the journey of responsible um, investing, although maybe in the comments that uh, there's someone uh, who uh, who has a, a an alternative view of that. But I think that there are still many foundations in Canada that are still starting from scratch to figure out where they fit. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity still to, uh, to grow this industry in Canada to really expand it. And then I think there's a lot we can learn from those folks who've already been in this sector uh, doing this impact investment work for many years. Uh, some that I mentioned earlier, some that I've, I've missed, uh, and, and some that are just trying to, to learn about it. So we have to remember that this is a moving um, this is a moving uh, uh, goal in terms of building our impact investment capacity up and uh, and that there are new uh, learnings that we can bring in both from Europe as well as uh, from our friends to the south. Uh, and, and then we have some really great Canadian made opportunities too that can be shared and showcased. So I just think that this is a really right opportunity for uh, for growth. And uh, and I'm just I'm really excited to see where it goes. Cassie, you're on, on mute. Yeah, uh, I'm going to weigh in on the trends on responsible investing, some of the things that I'm seeing coming forward. Uh, well, one of the things about going on this journey into the mainstream is that it has left responsible investing really prone to greenwashing. Because, you know, if there's money to be made by making claims about uh, the ESG, then uh, companies are going to do that. And what we're seeing is quite a few um, both regulatory uh, and investor-led initiatives to counteract that greenwashing uh, that, and make it um, uh, much more uh, transparent as to what is actually behind the claims that these uh, fund managers are making uh, and whether they stand up to scrutiny. So um, countering greenwashing as we move to mainstream is going to be uh, a big RI driver. And then you mentioned, Susan, that south of the border uh, in the US, we're seeing an anti-ESG, uh, anti-responsible investment movement. Uh, what's uh, what's sad there is is the kind of politicization of uh, of responsible investment into uh, uh, as part of the culture wars in the U.S. And but what was what's been interesting is that, that even though that anti-ESG sentiment is is surfacing, uh, what you find is large institutional investors saying that how much money they would lose. Uh, because that's still a big driver in the financial markets. Uh, if they if they moved away now from their ESG considerations, so um, 
Uh, Richard mentioned that um, looking at financial returns on these portfolios is also a driver. And I don't think that we can underrate um, that most, uh, most investors want their cake and eat it too. They want to have their financial return and they want those positive impacts. Uh, so uh, balancing those is going to be interesting. As we are virtually out of time, we still have some good questions. I'm, we're not going to get to in the question. One minute each, what would be your key takeaway for those who are interested in early stages of involvement in, in, in this area? Richard. I'm happy to go first and, and sort of take less than a minute. And actually, I thought I would ask, answer a couple of the questions that I saw come up on the, on the Q&A, because oh. one I'm shocked by and, and one I think underlines a lot of what we're talking about. The one I'm shocked by is the gentleman who said, if he imposed strict um, ethical and um, responsible constraints on his fund manager, he's been told his costs would double. Oh boy, would I like to compete with ever who told him that. That just tells me that they're not really up for doing it. They don't really believe in it. If you came to the UK, you would not find that fund managers typically charge you any more for good, solid ESG and ethical investment practices. We certainly don't. So the notion that doing ESG, having ethical constraints is going to cost you more that will immediately impact what your grant giving is, I'm shocked that somebody would have told you that. So that, as a fund manager, that's a glorious slam dunk of a question to say, um, seriously question your fund managers if they've said they'll double your fees for doing this type of thing. I, I just think that's off the pace. I thought another question was the one about um, the point about Ukraine and military things. Uh, my, my point about we're on a journey. We're, we're on a journey full stop, but we're also on a journey of, of morals and ethics and what we all believe in. And what I mean by that is things that were deemed deeply appropriate 10 or 15 or 20 years ago are deeply inappropriate now. Uh, you know, think of DNI and the way that that is changing. You know, but but also things like military. You know, military arms used to be a sin sector. You know, military was bad. I think the Ukraine has reminded everybody that actually defending your nation is not necessarily a sin. And actually having an arms manufacturing industry that allows others to defend their um, countries is also not necessarily a sin. So, yes, if you're a Quaker charity, I don't think you would ever invest in arms of any nature in the same way that if you're a Catholic charity, pharmaceuticals and right for life issues just cut too deeply. But for many others, there will be areas where ethics are moving. And I think arms is one where we are having a very active discussion with our clients. And some of them are now allowing us to buy arms companies in a way that they weren't 10 or 15 years ago. When I first started work 30 years ago, a lot of charities in the UK would not allow any investment in Japanese companies because of their behavior in between 39 and 45. Within five years of working, Japanese companies were deemed to have sort of rehabilitated themselves. So I think all of these things are moving constantly. And as trustees, you need to be thinking about them and thinking how all of your responsible stewardship, ESG, impact, all of this, how it evolves, what matters for you and what matters for you and is appropriate for you and your stakeholders today. So it is a journey and we're all on it. Christina. Yeah, I would agree with that, that this is a journey and remembering as foundations, those of us in the room who are representing a foundation, that we are where we are, partly from a history of where our foundation came from, but also um, um, from the people involved in it today. So I would just really encourage us to take advantage of those networks and opportunities, both learning from the academic sense um, and also from uh, organizations like Philanthropic Foundations Canada and the Environment Funders Canada. These are really great resources who have many people interested and, and actively working on these topics within their own foundations. And I, and I would say that whenever I've reached out for help, or shared or shared my um, perspective with others, there's a very openness to learning from each other. So I just encourage any foundations in the room to, to pursue that. Yes, the last word to you. I would say um, keep at it. Uh, basically set targets and measure progress against those targets. I think for organizations, um, it's really good to pick three major issues to focus on. And as Christina and Richard have said, learn from others. There's others that have been on this journey and are always willing to share uh, their experience. 
Thanks to the three of you. It's clear that we uh, could go for much longer. We'll need to have another session and uh, and dig into some of these and, and address some of the really interesting questions that uh, we didn't get to. Thank you all. And to those of you who joined us, thank you for being part of another MPNL Philanthrothink. Well, Chad, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.